with the doctor in front of my name, which is kind of cool. Um, but yeah, in industry, it's like, you, you work with a wide range of people, and some of them uh, think PhDs are very snobby, so don't go by doctor so-and-so. I go by Matt at work. Um, that's just the culture at Lord, at least. But other engineers have told me also, in you know, completely different fields, like don't go by doctor so-and-so. I think that's a university thing. Um, so first I'm gonna just go over a few things, tell you a little bit about Lord, the corporate you know, mumbo jumbo stuff, and then get into what I did at NC State, my interview process at Lord, and what I'm doing so far. Um, I started there July 24th, so about nine months or so. So please interrupt, ask questions. This should be a conversation, not just me talking at you. Like the derogatory question, that was a great, great way to go on a tangent. Um, so Lord, uh, you can see our vision and mission statement and values. Uh, they were founded almost 100 years ago. And we have now like 3,000 employees worldwide. Um, we are really split into two kind of focus groups. One of them is chemicals, and the other one's mechanical stuff. And I'm really just going to focus on the chemical stuff here because I don't know much about the mechanical stuff. Um, you can see some of our sites around the world. Cary, North Carolina, is the global headquarters and the R&D headquarters in the world. Um, we have some other big sites for R&D, though, uh, in China, in Europe, in Brazil, and some of their manufacturing sites around the world. And a pretty cool thing, I was actually sent to Germany because a lot of my projects deal with German customers. And in January, they sent me there. So I had the opportunity to travel for a week and go talk face to face with some of the people I've been working with. So that was really cool. And the Lord Germany team was kind of like escorting me around the whole time. And I didn't have to think or plan anything. They just arranged everything for me. So that was cool. I had to plan the technical talks <coughs> and get it and stuff. But, um, yeah, it's cool working with a global company because you have those opportunities to travel and go other places and meet people. Um, so I'll give you this uh, cheesy video which just says. <laughs> Welcome to Lord Corporation, an industry leader in providing highly reliable solutions, a company that meets customer challenges through innovation. Lord develops cutting edge technologies and proven solutions for industries such as aerospace and defense, automotive, commercial vehicles, industrial equipment, oil and gas, and electronics. Lord Corporation was founded in 1924 by patent attorney Hugh Lord in Erie, Pennsylvania. Today, Lord is headquartered near Raleigh, North Carolina, and employs more than 3,000 people in 26 countries. Across our 10 global research and development sites, we create solutions for customers matching demanding needs with know-how. Then, we produce the products with our advanced manufacturing capabilities at 19 manufacturing facilities around the world. We have more than 560 patents and 8,500 products that deliver on our promise of being a leading solution provider in performance materials and adhesives and motion and vibration controls. Our products can be found in smartphones, space vehicles, commercial and military aircraft, drones, oil rigs, as well as vehicles of all kinds, from electric cars to heavy machinery to rail and tractors. Lord Corporation, creating materials and solutions that will move the world. That's a better overview than I could give, but um, you get an idea. So you've probably never seen a Lord product because we don't sell to consumers. We sell to other companies that make an end product that will be sold to a consumer. So you've probably never seen anything, but there's probably Lord materials in your car, like you said, the cell phone or whatever. Um, and yeah, the two focuses, the mechanical and sensing systems and vibration control on aerospace, helicopters, uh, that kind of thing. Um, that's how the company got started by Hugh Lord. He was a, apparently a, a patent attorney or a lawyer in Erie and got annoyed by the rail cars making too much noise. So he came up with this rubber to metal bonding for vibration control and it dampened the noise. And then they've 
because of that, I mean, I think that's really why we are what we are today. Because rubber and metal, you got your materials, it's a mechanical thing for the whole uh, rail car, but it's also chemical technology to make the right kind of materials that have the right dampening prop uh, properties. Oops. So we are, these are some of the companies that we work with um, and we're suppliers to. It's a whole range of companies. And we do partner with a lot of research institutes and universities. Um, these are just a few of them. So, yeah, I think I'll just go right into my story now, unless anyone has any questions about Lord in general. Um, I will say that it's a pretty nice sized company for me, 3,000 employees. In the global R&D site in, here in Cary, there's about 400 to 450. And uh, in the electronic materials group where I work, there's like 20 or so scientists and engineers. And um, you saw that we have over 8,500 products. And that's because we will make a custom product for whatever our customers' needs are. So we have a whole variety of products that we make, a very, very large portfolio. And technology is always changing. The customer's needs are always changing. So we're always making new products. So it's, it's very cool that such a small amount of people are responsible for a wide variety of products. And really, being this size, uh, they put a lot of responsibility into everyone's hands. Everybody has multiple projects, and we all rely on each other. It's not like you can just focus on one problem and worry about that only for three months or six months or whatever. You're going to be doing like five different things every day. And it's going to be crazy. But I think that's, that's one of the fun things about working there. It's never boring. There's always something going on, always something new happening. And uh, for a company this size, um, you have to wear a lot of hats and do a lot of different things. So your uh, you're 400 person site, is that all uh, scientists and engineers and techs, or is there manufacturing there too? No, so there's no manufacturing in Cary. Um, we have manufacturing sites in Indianapolis and in Erie, Pennsylvania. Um, the group I'm in is electronic materials, and we do thermal management materials to try to dissipate heat from all, the, all of your electronics, like computers, to smart watches, cell phones, to electric vehicles. Um, all of our adhesive stuff, that's made in Erie, Pennsylvania. So that's a lot more dangerous chemicals. I work primarily with silicones that aren't bad for you, but like acrylics and other things, uh, they kind of smell bad and don't want to breathe them. So fortunately, they're made at a different site. And, uh, yeah, so those are the two manufacturing sites. In Cary, there's chemical research, which is like the basic research group, and that supports electronic materials, which, like I said, is all of the electronic stuff and structural adhesives, which are both growing rapidly. Um, basically, car companies are trying to glue cars together now instead of using nuts and bolts because glue is lighter and, in some cases, even stronger. Um, so our adhesives group is growing. The electronics group is growing. And those are the two kind of application groups that are supported by the basic research group. Um, yeah, and as far as the chemical technology goes, that's what we have here. And then a lot more in Erie is the rubber to metal bonding. Um, they do tank liners for shipping dangerous chemicals and put special liners inside that prevent corrosion of the tank. Um, a lot of that is for the elastomers and rubber to metal bonding. Any more questions? Okay, so just briefly, uh, I was in the Genzer group here for six years. It took me a little while. Um, and I did a very fundamental project looking at how PDMS network uh, structure property relationships and really looking at things like molecular weight, end group, chemical functionality, cross linker type. Uh, catalyst and how all of these things can come together and influence your final cured material properties such as uh, modulus dynamic mechanical properties and looking at how water interacts on the surface of PDMS materials depending on how you cross-link them um, with a very loose application <coughs> in microfluidics maybe. Um, 
So it was very fundamental. I had very infrequent reports or deadlines. We had to do like a yearly, uh, very brief report to our funding agency. Um, we had group meetings pretty regularly that we'd have to provide updates for, but very far out, open-ended, no deadlines kind of thing, which has its pros and cons. Um, I also did a few collaborations with uh, a few people in the Dicky group and uh, Ishan Deshit. Um, a little bit of Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> um, collaborations are good. Definitely do them whenever you can. Uh, I think from an industry perspective, you're going to be working in a team, so get as much experience as you can working with others and talk about what you contributed to the projects, but you're definitely going to be in a team in industry. Um, other than that, I went to a few conferences, APS, uh, Triangle Soft Matter conferences. I did the three minute thesis competition. I also helped out with our group retreat planning. And then some extracurriculars. I was involved in the GSA, did recruiting captain. Uh, I did the preparing the press professoriate program because I didn't know what I wanted to do, industry or academia. For a while I wanted to be a professor, but um, towards the end I decided I'd rather do much more applied research that's going to be used in the real world much more quickly. Um, so I went that route. And also just IMs for fun. So I had all of these different experiences to draw from during interviews and could talk about collaborations on a research level or working with the GSA to plan an event or something just like this. Um, yeah. So then the interview process, uh, there was actually a Triangle Soft Matter poster competition or poster session that I didn't really want to go to because I was trying to scramble and finish my dissertation chapters. It was like a month before I was going to defend, but Dr. Genzer kind of insisted I should go to it. Um, turns out Lord was there, so that was good. And they saw my poster, and I had thought this whole time that it was very fundamental PDMS research. But the manager, my current manager now, came up to me and he was like, why haven't you applied here yet? And it turns out what I was doing could actually be very applied to all the problems they're facing. They were actually doing some of the same experiments I was, because uh, silicone technology or PDMS is fairly new to the group and growing. They're shifting a lot of resources that way, so it was very fortunate that the timing worked out such that I was graduating soon and they were in need of someone with my background. But I had thought this whole time that it was very fundamental, but um, in looking at the job description they had, they talk about being a formulation scientist and developing products. And when I thought about it, that is kind of what I was doing. I was, when you formulate, you mix a bunch of things together and see how they influence the resulting material properties. And I was doing that just without an application in mind. But to them, it was very important to be able to predict how their materials would perform uh, for a variety of crazy customer needs, which I'll get into in a little bit. So um, I applied and <clears throat> Fortunately, things went well. I had a brief like 30 minute phone interview with someone from HR and they invited me for an on-site interview. And that involved a 45 minute talk with 15 minutes of Q&A. And I basically just gave my defense, modified it a little bit. Um, I brought some props, I brought Silly Puppy. They liked that, so especially people who have some sort of hands-on demonstration that can go along with their project, that's a big way, a good way to keep the audience engaged, and I received some feedback that that was a good idea. Um, after that, I had two separate three-person panels interviewing me, both from the technology <coughs> side uh, for like another 45 minutes to an hour. I had a one-on-one 30-minute -on -one session with someone from business and marketing, who I later learned was like pretty high up in European business stuff who happened to be visiting because someone else couldn't fill in for the interview, so this guy was like, I don't know, VP or pretty high up. And we just talked about electric cars the whole time. It was pretty cool. But I knew that's what they were getting into <coughs> and having some sense of where the market is going. Uh, so if you're interviewing, thinking about the, the wider scope of what you're doing outside of your individual project, I think that's a good way to show people that you're aware of you know, what's going on in the world. Um, then we had, I had lunch with another technology employee, employee. <coughs> Probably judged my manners and stuff and made sure I wasn't a slob or anything like that. Um, 
and then a site tour. And then the last thing, uh, which I was very bad at, was negotiating offer terms. If you talk to the Career Center, I think everyone tells you you should ask for more money. But I felt very awkward doing that, and honestly I didn't, which was dumb, probably. But I did negotiate the start date. They had asked me to start pretty soon, and I was going to be traveling and stuff, and I wanted to have a little more time off, and they were okay with that. Um, but if you do get a job offer, I highly recommend talking to the career services and seeing what is a good way to go about negotiating. Um, I was looking at Glassdoor to see what um, people with similar titles, what the average salary was, that's one way. And it was right around there, so I didn't feel like I had that strong of a uh, stance to negotiate for more money, but that's what they say you should do. Okay, so this is a lot of the stuff that my group works on. Um, electric vehicles, It's that's where it's at. Um, everything is like we're doing things that we're doing in microelectronics, where you have very small volumes of material on a computer circuit board, and they could sell that for stupid high margins because it's computers and stuff is expensive. That's moving into what we're calling macro electronics now, where you have a whole electric vehicle. And car companies have a lot of leverage, so they can really push the price down. And that's one of the cool things, I think, about my job, is trying to figure out the, the way to balance performance of the material with the cost of the material. Because if they say we're not going to buy it for this much money, then we can't sell anything. And um, yeah, so working with car companies is definitely new for Lord, and it's a learning experience for us as we try to figure out what they need, and they try to figure out what they need too. Really, no one knows how to build an electric car. Tesla can make really expensive ones, but they're struggling to make cheap ones. So everyone's trying to figure this out as we go. It's a really exciting time. Matt, um, you yeah. interface directly with the supplier. The supplier. Or sorry, you in you know, with the customer. Yes. Okay. Yep, so like when I went to Germany, I had face-to-face -face meetings with car companies. Um, I have weekly or every other week conference calls with some car companies or people who are working for those companies. Um, I do also have, we have interfaces with our suppliers, people giving us raw materials, and we do the same thing where we try to negotiate prices with them. Obviously, the larger volumes we buy, the lower price we can get. We try to tell them what kind of materials we would need. Um, but for them, we're just one customer, and they got the same kind of thing, a bunch of other customers, and we're probably very small, um, at least in terms of the silicone market, because a lot of them are in cosmetics and caulking. That's much higher volumes than what we're doing, so we're kind of like small change for them. It's kind of a annoying little company poking them to make these specialty materials. So how much of your job do you think is business versus the actual science? I don't do much business. Okay. Um, I have to keep in mind the cost of materials. Uh, I don't do any sort of finance or accounting or anything like that, though. I just try to make things as cheap as possible. Um, that being said, um, I had some, I'm get into this, but uh, like the teams I'm working on has people from every, everywhere. We have technology, we have scale up people, we have manufacturing people, we have uh, supply chain and sourcing, regulatory people. Obviously, the business salespeople, marketing people, we're all working on the same project, trying to land a deal with one of these car companies. Hopefully, get a contract for like three years. They're going to use our material in their first generation EV or something like that. Um, but yes, yeah, so our materials would go into uh, the battery charger, the battery pack itself, uh, the electric motors. All of these things generate heat, especially as they're trying to do rapid charging to make it more like filling up at a gas station. That's really high voltage and a ton of energy being transferred into these batteries and it's not that efficient yet. So there's a lot of heat waste generated. And you've probably heard about like exploding cell phones, right? Because the battery blows up. So we don't want that to happen for, for cars. That would be very bad. Um, we do have a partnership with Cree, which is um, started by NC State material science graduates like 20 or 30 years ago. And we supplied some materials to their LEDs. Um, we're also doing stuff with uh, companies like AVB, working with them to supply materials for their transformers. Um, and getting into solar and wind, all of the solar panels can have a variety of special material needs, and that's what we do, make custom materials for whatever the customer needs. Okay. Let's see if this works. Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> We've already gotten into this due to the questions. What would you say you do here? You guys see this? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, this is a great movie. So, what do I do here? Well, in the first month, not very much at all. It was like sitting at my desk trying to stay awake, a lot of online training videos. I don't even remember what it was. But it was boring, though. I was in the lab trying to shadow people, help out however I could, not really knowing what I was doing, slowly getting trained on instruments. And then it was like they flipped a switch and was like, go. And OK, I'm the technical leader on four projects now, and supporting another. And my mind is, is exploding because I don't know what to do. And I'm supposed to be driving these projects. It really was is like, OK, enough, enough training. Go do all this now. Um, one thing I would say is lacking with Lord is the onboarding process and training for new employees it's basically non existent. That is something we're working on now. Um, and that was something I was a part of with a few other employees to develop training modules for new hires because they recognize that is a weakness they have. And we need to bring people up to speed more quickly. Um, but yeah, so like I mentioned, the, the teams I'm working on for, uh, since then, that was too much. I told my manager, like, I can't handle all of this. I was working 12, 14 hour days, working weekends, which Lord had said during the whole interview process, like, oh, we value work-life balance. You should be working 40 hours a week. And that wasn't happening. So I told my manager, I was like, the project's going to suffer because I can't give it the attention it needs. And I am suffering because I'm going crazy. Uh, and so he was very responsive to that. He said he wants his employees working 40 hours a week. He doesn't want us to burn out. This isn't an Intel kind of company where they just work you to death in two years. Um, he knows people who went to Intel too. Um, yeah, so he switched me down to just three projects, which is much more manageable. Two of them are very related to each other, so it's much more pleasant to work there now. Um, but yeah, that's what I said, like being in a small company and these new projects are coming online because our salespeople are crazy. They're working with like every car company, trying to get new prototype material sampled to them without really <coughs> consulting any of the technical people. And they just say yes to everything and then tell us we need to turn around and do it real quickly. That's part of the, you know, the fun craziness of working there. Um, but everyone else on this team is also going crazy. It's not just the technical people. So um, I would be the technical lead, which I do kind of a little bit of everything, some scale up, some paperwork, some in the lab formulations, some material characterization um, with a few other uh, people. They're called technologists. Um, they're typically people with a bachelor's degree in material science, chemi, chemistry, uh, who do a lot of similar work, but more focused on just being in the lab. Um, we have uh, technical services or applications engineers, which are very customer focused. Those are the technical people that are on site troubleshooting any problems that the customer has. Uh, if it's, like I said, dispensing material that's not curing, or the material, uh, I don't know, is usually cure related, or just teaching them how to use the material. So they travel all the time and like rack up all the reward smiles and stuff. Um, then we have process scale up and manufacturing. So we have a, a scale-up team who tries to figure out if we make 100 grams of this stuff, that's kind of the smallest scale we work at. Um, how do we make 1,000 pounds of it? Um, the mixing is very different. We've got to make sure the rheology is the same with the final material. And they do all of that scale-up, figuring that out. And obviously manufacturing. Uh, it's an exciting time at Lord that we have a site in Indianapolis, and they just install a third shift. So they're running 24-7 to make all the materials and keep up with the demand of the customers that we're working with. Because electric vehicles are like, everyone's trying to beat each other and get into this as quickly as possible and catch up to Tesla. We have analytical scientists. So these are people who really focus on chemistry and do all kinds of like GCMS, uh, NMR, um, FTIR, real chemical characterization. And then we have material scientists who can do rheology, dynamic mechanical, um, uh, mechanical testing, TGA, DSC, those kind of tests. 
Um, so I could do some of that as well, but they're quicker, and more efficient, and the experts at it. So normally, we'll just ask them to help us out with uh, any sort of characterization we need. Uh, program management is kind of like a catch-all. These people make sure the project moves forward. There's all kinds of things in the background that I've never thought about, like just shipping material in the right size container, uh, dealing with all of the regulations of shipping internationally, imports, tariffs. Um, we have regulatory to help with that, making SDS paperwork. Uh, and like I said, sourcing, our supply chain people, business and marketing. So I've interfaced with all these people, um, I mean, at least every other day. I've probably interfaced with all of these people. So that whole working on a team, you gotta stay on top of your game, because if you mess up, that causes a ripple effect where it propagates, and then everyone has to redo what they were doing. Um, yeah, and then the customer. That is a primary concern for me. I'm very much on the D side of R&D, development, rapid prototypes, not the long-term research, um, which is stressful, but also fun, because you get to see like the materials I'm working on could be in electric cars in two years or something. So something that I helped make is actually there in the real world. And that's what I was really looking for in grad school. I mean, my time in grad school, I was kind of tired of the fundamental stuff. So they are what's driving it, and they don't know anything about anything. <laughs> it's, it's like customers will be like, oh, we want it to flow like mayonnaise or something. Like they don't know what rheology is or viscosity. <coughs> Um, hardness, yeah, the durometer, that's, that's a simple technique. We're not going to try to explain modulus to them or anything. So interfacing with those kind of people and helping to help them understand the material's properties and where the trade-offs are, because everything's an optimization problem. You can fill it with a bunch of metal, and it will be highly thermally conductive, but it won't be soft and flexible. And so you have to optimize things and help them understand what is and is not possible. Um, so Tim Forens uh, gave a talk for Dr. Alice's uh, professional development class. I highly recommend that. I took that class with him about a few years ago. Um, so some of these slides are coming from his talk. But this is kind of the idea of how things go. Um, you have a customer need, and we have some sort of technology that may, might work. And the higher-ups decide, yeah, we're going to pursue this. Then we do a bunch of experimentation, proof of concept, and developing that, refining it, trying to do that optimization until we get a product that's like good enough. You always like could improve it more, but you don't have time to do that because it's competition. I mean, Lord has a bunch of competitors who are all doing the same thing, trying to get deals with these car companies, so you don't have time to make it perfect. Um, yeah, and product developer, I've kind of brought in the range that Tim had there. I, I think that's where I kind of fall into experimentation, proof of concept, and developing. And yeah, the, the timeline there is pretty accurate. We could be doing things probably six months to three years out, maybe two years, but research will be doing the longer term stuff and helping, helping us use the right tools to do what we need to do. Okay, so this is kind of what it's like at work. They're already up to eight on the gauges. Anything over 15, we get impaired judgment of blackouts, the beginnings of brain asphyxia. What about the scrubbers on the command module? It takes white cartridges. The ones on the lemon round. <laughs> Tell me this isn't a government operation. It's just this isn't a contingency we remotely looked at. Those CO2 levels are going to be getting toxic. Well, I suggest you gentlemen in Benway put a square peg in a round hole. Rebel. Okay, people, listen up. People upstairs. Candidate is just one, and we gotta come through. We gotta find a way to make this fit into the hole for this. Using nothing but that. 
certain materials that pass all of the regulations that they're allowed to be shipped internationally. <clears throat> Ideally, we're using low-cost materials. Ideally, we're using ones that we already use in other products rather than a brand new material. So our formulations could be like 10 different ingredients that we put into it. And we gotta make sure all 10 of them check all the boxes before we start sampling them to a customer. Because like this has happened, we sent a sample to a customer, and then like two weeks later, like a sample is um, it's probably like it, it's a 400 milliliter cartridge that they can dispense, so not very much material. And then they'll turn around and say, we want like 10 five gallon pails of it. So we need to be able to scale it up very quickly. And if we're using a new raw material that's not in our system, the whole like Lord system of how our inventory, we've already checked it out with the suppliers, like that's nearly impossible. It, we have this small toolbox of things that we can work with. Um, research's job is to make that toolbox bigger for us to develop things so we can use and turn more knobs and try different things to make uh, whatever product we need to. And the developer's job is to use that toolbox and just make the best material we can at the lowest cost. So yeah, my. The job title I interviewed for was a product development scientist as, since was changed to senior engineer. But that's what I primarily do is formulate new products to meet customer requirements. And customer requirements could be all over the place. Um, but we need to optimize viscosity, modulus or hardness, um, thermal and electrical properties, which I had no experience with before coming here. Um, and then characterize them for aging and degradation. They want to do accelerated aging to see how long this stuff will last in a car, which I had no experience with. Um, looking at adhesion, um, if they need to rework something in the car, they want to be able to like pop it off by hand or with a small tool without damaging anything so it can't stick too strongly, at least the stuff I'm working on. The adhesive screw obviously wants stronger adhesion. Uh, making sure the stuff we're using is compatible with any sort of fluids that a car can come in contact with. If it's a hybrid, there's still going to be gasoline, transmission fluid, all that kind of stuff. Um, I do some of the scale-up work too, which is actually kind of fun. Um, we have like a 100 gram scale up to a kilogram scale, and then the next one after that is like a 15 to 20 kilogram scale. And we'll be making one to two gallons of material. The raw materials are very dense, like three times the density of water. Um, but that's like pouring kilograms of raw materials into a big mixer and mixing it, um, which is like uh, manual labor, but it's better than sitting at the computer all day. And you actually make a gallon of material like, when you're done. And it's fulfilling to me. I don't know. It's, it's kind of cool to just. Like, yeah, this works 100 gram scale, it's now working at 15 kilogram scale, and we're shipping this to a customer to see if it works in their application. Um, yeah, so the customer interactions are pretty frequent, depending on how far along in the project we are. For some of them that we've been working with for longer, we have weekly calls or bi-weekly calls. Others, maybe once a month, we'll be in touch with them. Sometimes we get to go visit them face to face. Our applications engineers do more of the visiting to figure out what it is they're trying to do. Um, I have to help out with paperwork, making SDS documents, uh, fulfilling all of the shipping documents and order forms, keeping track of our raw material inventory. So some of this may be similar to what you do in grad school now. Um, and then the other things, like I mentioned, I help develop the training module, um, always trying to learn new equipment and new characterization techniques. Um, we do have meetings with our raw material suppliers where we try to tell them to make cheaper products for us. Um, this is one thing. We used to have group meetings in the Genza group. Um, I don't know how much of you guys know, but they can go long sometimes. Uh, in the industry, no one has time for that. So our group meetings, like people are limited to one slide in five minutes. So you need to hit all the, the key points, and they're monthly. And this is for a broad audience, remember, that you got your global supply chain, your business people, everyone's there. So you can't get too technical. Um, so that was a little different. And we also do lab cleanups and safety training, 
Uh, Lord has a monthly safety meeting for a half hour with all of the uh, chemical technology people. Um, they're currently doing some lab renovations, so we've been shuffling things around and doing lab cleanups. And one thing is they throw away like any chemical that's more than two years old. So having a well-funded research lab is kind of nice. <laughs> so you have the luxury to do that and things don't accumulate forever. Um, so that's one of the differences. But I think that's about it. I have some pictures. This is where I sit. It's a nice cube, no windows. Gotta work my way up before I get a window. Um, this is a dispensing trial that I actually saw in Germany. This is our material being pumped through, like, water. basically like a giant 3D printer. Like water. Right through the garbage can. They do with the dispensing trials. They just pump it through and see if there's any issues. It's like so much material wasted. But if you can see in the back, there's like drums of material and these big tubes pump it through. And this is really, really high viscosity stuff, like much higher than maple syrup or honey. And they can make, make it pump. And this is new. They're developing the equipment to handle these materials for the car companies. All of it's new and exciting. That's kind of what it looks like. Uh, one thing is we need to have it high enough viscosity so that you can dispense it and then turn it vertical and it doesn't drip down. Um, this is when things go wrong. We have a smaller version of this in our lab, and that's not supposed to be covered with material. Uh, so that accidentally went straight into the pail, and I had to spend like three hours cleaning it with someone. So you still have those kind of situations where you stop fixing an instrument. Um, that still happens. Um, these are some other just weird tests that we've developed to try to meet what the customers are asking for. So this high viscosity, it requires a lot of force to compress it, and they want things around one millimeter thickness. Um, so we just kind of use like an Instron kind of thing and push this out, call it a squeeze flow test. Like there's no set guidelines, and it's not as structured as you might think, kind of making it up on the fly. Uh, another one, because that durometer test is so subjective and depends on what person's doing it, we try to use like an Instron to, sorry, uh, this one to poke the material to different depths and see what the force register it is, and that's a bit more objective. Um, looking at how materials age, so before and after aging, if it cracks, that's bad. So things like that that I never really thought of in grad school. Um, but that's all I got. If you guys have any more questions, or, yeah. So, okay, did you have industrial experience before you got to the board? I did. I did have an internship for one summer in undergrad. I worked at Hess Oil Refinery. Um, it was basically a process engineer. Um, I don't think that was really relevant to any of this, though. Yeah, so I guess my question is, like, if you're coming in and you don't have industrial experience, and you know that you want to go into industry, do you think that would be a problem, or like, did they ask you a lot about your internship, or was it mainly about your grad school? They didn't ask me, like, at all about my internship. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think it's okay. Obviously, industry experience helps, but it's still, you, you can still get by without any, just talk about teamwork and problem solving, turning things around quickly, I don't know. Um, yeah, these are some tidbits of advice I have. Try to tailor your resume, use words in the job description on your resume. Um, definitely send a cover letter. Um, so as soon as I got there, don't come in like oh, I'm a big pastry. I know exactly how to do things. People will hate you. <laughs> I was like quiet, open-minded, ask questions, try to learn as much as possible from people. Yeah, don't tell people what to do. Um, definitely, you're working in a team, so recognize those who contribute. Uh, Lord has like this internal uh, achieve award thing where you can give people points for doing something above and beyond and those points can tally up and you can buy things with that or get a gift card or something. Uh, that goes a long way. Definitely publicly acknowledge people and privately acknowledge them for contributing, especially as a technical lead. And, you know, I have a lot of people, no one reports to me, but I have a lot of people kind of working together on projects. And as the technical lead, you would definitely want to acknowledge people for their hard work. Um, definitely try to stay organized. You're gonna have a to-do list that's too long, but you can't procrastinate because like I said, is that ripple effect. 
if you mess up something or you're late on something that causes this propagation where everyone else can't do their job because they're waiting on you, you don't want to be in that situation. Uh, definitely tell your manager if you're working too hard. Um, that was something, like my first six months I started, I wanted to say yes to everything, like yeah, I can do that, I can do that, but it, it eventually caught up with me. And I couldn't <clears throat> keep that up, so uh, if you have a good manager, hopefully they will recognize that they don't want to burn you out, unless you're an Intel. But, uh, yeah, definitely just speak up and tell them if you're not able to do this, because ultimately the project and the company will suffer, and you will suffer if you can't do good quality work like they hired you to do. Um, offer to help others. Do a lot of that. People need a hand with something, because there will definitely be a time when you need their help on some last minute thing. Um, and you're working in a team with many different areas of expertise to so try to help people understand what you're doing. Um, you're gonna be working with different personalities. You may not like everyone you work with, but talk about some of these things on your uh, interview if you get the chance, like the fact that you have worked with people, because at least here it's definitely in a team. And um, I'm not too shy about sharing my opinion at work. I think they hired you for your brain, right? If you think something's not gonna work, speak up. Um, you want to do this tactfully, don't you know, diss someone in front of everyone else, especially your manager or something, but privately you can bring this up if you have a disagreement with your manager over a technical issue or to the team, just explain why or better yet show data that would prove that what they're saying is incorrect. But yeah, don't be afraid, don't just sit back and listen after you've been there for a little while because they, they hired you for your expertise. I don't know, that's what I think. How much before your defense do you think you should start looking for a job? Or before you think um, you'll be gone out of grad <clears throat> So I defended in June. I think I was beginning to look in January or so, really picking up in maybe April or May. It's a stressful time because looking for jobs is a lot of work. So is finishing your PhD. Yeah. Um, I had a question on the technical side. Um, what was the learning curve on the technical side when you joined the board? Because in your PhD, you're working with uh, like teaching us. Like, do you have to learn new chemistries, like additives or new kind of materials, and understand their structure property relationships? Or yeah. Um, so I didn't really work with much build systems. I was looking at just the polymers, but. It, for these materials, we use a lot of different fillers. So the whole relationship between a solid, you know, rigid particle in the polymer matrix, and I didn't know anything about that, really. Um, and I just kind of learned by doing, asking people, shadowing people. There wasn't training, unfortunately, but um, yeah, just, just practicing and becoming familiar with it. And I don't think it took me that long to catch on to the, like, the rules of thumb, I guess, in terms of what you should do. But then you don't have to follow them entirely. Um, you could play around and do, do things a little differently and see how they turn out. Um, but yeah, I don't think it was that bad. Maybe by three months or so, I felt fairly competent in the lab, and doing things that I had uh, confidence in, I guess. Yeah, um, yeah I was going to say, I Thanks for um, mentioning the hiring process, and that seems like a pretty in-depth, that second step where you went and did all the on-site stuff. Did you know at that time, um, I guess, did you have a sense for like how many people you were competing with for the job, or like was that a pretty stressful process, it seems like? Yeah, I, I don't know how many people I competed with. Um, I could tell you, we recently had a job open in the structural adhesives mm -hmm. for a PhD or a master's with few years of research, and they got over 140 applications. So yeah, the job market is tight. And those are like the people that get HR interviews, and then beyond that, it'll be like a uh, second cut that they bring them on. They may have just been resumes. I'm not sure. I don't know how many they filtered it down to. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know how many. I was more stressed about my defense, yeah. quite honestly. Right. And that, <laughs> that was like, that was after that. Um, I didn't really know exactly what I wanted yet, so I didn't put too much pressure on myself, and I was like, if it doesn't work out, that's okay. Um, that was also my first on-site 
No, second on-site interview. I was rejected by the ASF earlier. <laughs> um, yeah. So, I mean, having a few practice runs definitely helps. And I didn't feel too incredibly nervous about it. I just passed my defense. So I was like, if I can do that, I can talk to people about my research. Can you, uh, you've obviously mentioned that it's a lot more fast paced, but you probably have to develop some time management practices that are different than grad school. Are there anything particularly you've picked up now that you might, might have wanted to incorporate as a grad student? Huh. In my job, like more people rely on me as a grad student. I was fairly independent, and if my project got delayed, Really, just like me or Kenzer would suffer from that. But if now if my project gets delayed, that is a much bigger impact. So, yeah, it's very tough to balance things. I try to keep a to do list, um, try to prioritize things based on how urgent the need is from the customer. I'm slowly getting better at pushing back on the customer when they say they need something by tomorrow. I was like, do you really need it? Uh, and telling them, well, we can't do that, we'll get it to you in a week, and they're like, oh, that's fine. Um, yeah, for me, it's just kind of what is the higher priority in the moment. I could have a whole plan for the day, like this just happened yesterday. I knew these things I was gonna do, but then someone, one of the sales guys came in, <coughs> gave me a curveball from the customer, and that just changed everything, and that took highest priority that day. Um, <coughs> I, yeah, I was working long hours, but I still try not to work at home too much or at all. Um, I have my email on my phone, but I usually don't respond unless I see that it's urgent. Um, I'm trying to cut down my hours, too. So like some people work maybe 7 to 4. It's typical. I'm more of an 8 to 6 kind of person with a 30-minute lunch break or so. I'm um, trying to cut that down to more like 8 to 5.30 or something. Um, and I was working several weekends back when I had more projects because I couldn't keep up with everything. Um, and that's definitely not what they want. I was the only one there. I was unsafe. I probably shouldn't do that. Um, and my, I told my manager, and he's like, yeah, don't do that. And just, I, I don't know. Time management is just, I'm still learning, I think. Uh, I can't set the priorities by myself. It kind of comes from a bigger picture as to what is most urgent. and kind of just have to do that. Um, learned how to delegate more. Um, I was taking on a lot of things by myself, but after helping some other people get trained on things, now they're quite proficient and I can just count on them to get things done. So um, yeah, you don't have to do everything yourself. I did kind of feel like that when I started. I didn't want to ask for help or ask other people to help me do something. but. It's a team, so people are willing to help. Yeah. When you were <clears throat> first applying for jobs, in terms of like the research areas that you were looking into, were they all kind of very similar to what you were doing in grad school, or I guess a little bit sort of advice there on how to branch out or not branch out, or yeah, that whole whatever you do in grad school won't determine your future. I don't know about that. <laughs> um, so I was polymer science kind of material science, soft matter, and I was looking for jobs in those areas. Um, I was looking at national labs for a postdoc that was doing similar research to what I was doing, like not exactly the same, but in the same area of polymer science and materials characterization. And that's what this was too. Um, I don't know how much you can really branch out, maybe in like a consulting job. They're hiring you more for your problem solving skills, not necessarily what you did as a grad student. For me, th this really was a match of my technical background with their needs and the right timing. Um, yeah, the ASF, I'm trying to remember, that one it was a rotational program, so I would have been doing different things. So I don't think that was necessarily for my background in polymer science. Um, it maybe it just depends. You can try to branch out, and I, I really don't know. Um, I know some friends who have had some trouble trying to find things outside of uh, their area of expertise they've worked on. So, 
Not just mine. <laughs> other friends and other schools and stuff. No, most of them end up doing. So I had uh, two other friends, three other friends who went to grad school, and they all kind of did something similar for a job as to what they did in their PhD. I don't think it's impossible to do something else, but that makes it harder. I had no interest in going into like a bio role or anything like that, um, so that helped because I, I wasn't trying to do that. I didn't want to, um, or for that matter, computer simulations or anything. Like, I still wanted to do something with polymers and materials. How did you uh, How did you figure out what the pool of companies to look at that kind of had expertise in your area? Like. I, I'm guessing before you started looking, you didn't know who Lord was. Like, did you know I about heard of them just from being at NC State and going to some of those triangle soft matter things? And I looked at them over the years, and I mean they're a fairly small company. They're no Dow or Dupont or anything, um, so they weren't hiring that frequently. And they're still very lean. There's not that many people. Um, I used like Indeed and just put some keywords that I would try to look for. Um, I forget, I don't know, career fairs, definitely went to the career fairs and tried to see what the companies were. Um, and like I said, looking at national labs, that was another option for me. I'm not sure. I applied, I'm pretty sure I applied to Dow and DuPont uh, as well, just because I know they're big chemical companies and I would look for some jobs they had posted related to polymers. Um, I'm trying to think. I used Indeed, LinkedIn. I use that a lot just to search for jobs, um, search for companies. Probably LinkedIn and Indeed were the two that I used most. I don't know. Yeah. I, I was also like, I went to career services um, to go through like a mock interview and go over some of the things I was presenting, both for BASF and for Lord. And I think it. It's somewhat beneficial. They don't know all the companies that do whatever you want to do, though. It's spend a lot of time Googling, clicking on LinkedIn, I guess. So sort of in the same line of thinking, how aggressively do you think now we should be networking to try to get connections for jobs in the future? Um, I don't know. I don't like networking. <laughs> I don't think I did very much of it. Um, it certainly helped that Dr. Genzer and Dr. Dickey knew Tim Forens, who worked at Lord, um, and I had worked with both of them. And I think that was helpful. So use your advisors for their network, I think. That's a good way of going. I would not spend time just cold call or cold emailing people trying to network. Uh, you could talk to Russ O'Dell. He keeps track of all the, all the department alumni, and that may be a good way, because at least you have that in common that you both went to NC State. Um, you could try to reach out to those people through LinkedIn or something. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. Going to conferences, I think that is important, and sharing your work, because you never know who's going to notice it. And that's kind of what happened to me. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't focus too much on it until maybe your last year of grad school. Unless you want to do an internship. I mean, that's different when you're trying to get something more immediate. Well, if there are no other questions, that's all. Thank Matt for coming.